Um, okay, I think we're going to get cracking. Um, it's so lovely to see so many of you here this evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, I hope you're all as excited as I am to get cracking with Cult again. Um, this is the first in our new series, our 2022 series on emotion in painting. Uh, as you'll know, we've done various themes uh, in the last couple of years. Um, and this I wanted to focus in on. Um, I thought it was quite nice to look at um, emotions because we get a really varied range of pictures. I've specifically chosen um, different pictures from different periods of time. Um, and many of you will know, uh, for those of you who join regularly, that I've challenged myself by kicking off with um, a Fauvist painter, um, a modern painter, 20th century painter, uh, who is, um, which is slightly out of my uh, my usual remit, which is uh, tends to be older paintings and old master paintings. But it was really fun to look into this picture uh, this afternoon, and I hope that we all um, can enjoy it together uh, in the next half an hour or so. If anyone has any questions throughout, um, I would really appreciate if you could just pop it in the chat, and then we'll have about ten minutes at the end where. Um, we can answer questions or I can read out comments that anyone's made, um, but hopefully those will be visible to everyone. So please feel free to, to contribute and comment uh, as we go as we go along. Um, just in a nutshell, for those who haven't joined before, Cult is um, we, we set it up in 2019 and the aim of Cult, its mission really, is to create an online platform that creates accessible art historical content for a, specifically for a, a non-specialist um, and young audience. That said, everyone is welcome to join, um, but we want to start looking at paintings in their most formal slash informal capacity by starting at looking at shapes and colour and form um, and arrive at paintings with no art historical knowledge whatsoever. So while everyone's welcome, um, this session and the, the, the rest of the series really is aimed at, at, at those of you who, who want to, to look more, react to paintings, um, have a think about how they make you feel. Um, so I really would love it to be as, as uh, participatory as possible. Um, we are gonna be doing these live sessions every Monday evening for the next 10 Mondays at 6.30. Uh, at the beginning of every month, the first Friday of every month, we will also be doing in-person sessions um, where we will be meeting at an institution in London, for those of you who are London-based, um, on a Friday evening, and we'll be looking at uh, one work of art in the flesh um, focused on, on one of these themes that we're covering in this series on emotion. As well as that, a slightly new strand of content for Cult this year is that we're going to be creating short online uh, videos for you to look at and access at whenever works for you. So when you're doing the washing up or in the bath, on the commute, whatever works. And these will be probably no longer than three minutes, uh, but will provide you with some uh, hard hitting art historical facts. Um, so please do spread the word to anyone um, who you think might be interested um, and with without chatting anymore I thought we'd we'll get well I think we'll get cracking um, I'm going to start today's session in a slightly unusual way in that well in 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 the normal way I'm going to be I'm going to start by sharing uh, my screen um, again for those of you who who haven't joined cult before um, to explain, we we have the picture on the screen for the duration of the session. Um, this is really, really tempting to stray away from when we're looking at Matisse and this painting in particular, um, because there are so many comparative images that we could look at when looking at this picture. Um, but I really, really want to focus on um, not taking any of the attention away from the work of art that we are looking at um, and, and reacting to, which in the end is, is what art is all about. So I'm going to start by, I'm hoping this will work, um, by playing a piece of music 
um, and just playing it for a minute or so, which is supposedly inspired by this painting. It was um, composed by Stravinsky a few years after this painting was painted. Um, and it's called The Dances of the Young Girls. It's part of the Rite of Spring. Uh, many of you may know it, um, but it will just allow us to sit back and enjoy some music and take in the painting uh, for, for a minute or so to begin the session. Um, do, do pop a message in the chat if you can't hear the audio, but I'm hoping you can. So I hope that was a success. I haven't received any messages to say that no one could hear me. So um, fingers crossed you were all able to hear, um, hear that, that piece of music. Um, so as I said, that was actually composed after the painting was painted, um, but based on um, the joy which this painting uh, uh, was intended really to, um, to emanate or, or at least um, express. Um, and the painting, which uh, I'm sure many of you have seen from the email I've been sending out, was uh, commissioned in 1909 and painted in 1910. So that just immediately locates it uh, chronologically. And we'll talk about the commission um, and the artist shortly, but I just want to look at it um, as you have been doing for the last minute or so in its most basic capacity. So here we have five figures. Um, painted in quite a vibrant uh, orangey pinky red, depending on which reproduction you're looking at. Um, and I have been fortunate enough to uh, see the, the painting in the flesh and it is um, quite a, a, a burnt pink as it were. So it's a, a, a very bold pink with these slightly darker brownie orangey pinky um, contours, um, uh, fa um, facial expressions, and, and hair. Um, the figures are set against a very mundane, plain blue background. There is no uh, differentiation between um, areas of the background that are nearby and areas of the background that are far away. Uh, there's no difference in, there's no real difference in, um, in tone in the blue. Um, and so we have this sort of abyss of blue pigment uh, that takes up almost two thirds of the canvas. Um, and then in the bottom section, uh, we have this sort of tree-like formation, um, which is saturated with this very um, marine-like green color, um, which takes up the lower third uh, of, of the canvas. So we have, and, it, and in the same way as the, as the blue background, this green area is, is, uh, is not, it's not um, got any sense of, of form or undulation um, other than its, its contours, which provide a platform um, for the figures that are dancing on it. Um, 
the painting is almost three meters, is almost two and a half meters, it's just over two and a half meters high, sorry, and it's almost four meters wide. So it's absolutely enormous. Um, and we can see that the figures are dancing around, filling the entirety of the canvas, um, dancing in a circle. Their hands are joined um, and they are seemingly completely lost in their own, what appears to be a uh, sort of bac bacchanalian revelry. Um, they are completely um, absorbed in the pure act of dancing and uh, enjoying what appears to be a, a kind of ritual experience. Um, the concept of space in the painting is one of its most uh, important elements, I suppose. And we can see the artist here creating a sense of space through layering the figures not in depth so not thinking about how far back the painting how far back the figures are and how far forward they are but but rather giving them a sense of relationship to one another by placing some on top um, and some below and by doing this he he creates a sense of um of of space recess recessing into the into the the picture frame for those of you who looked at it intently enough when we were listening to um, Stravinsky, you will have noticed that all of the hands are joined, except for the two hands uh, in the center of the painting that are almost touching. Um, I've been looking at the Sistine Chapel ceiling this week, and <laughs> it reminds me very much of the creation of Adam uh, by Michelangelo on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the sense that in that composition, all of the tension in the diverse and dense composition of the Sistine ceiling ends in this central tense point where these fingers aren't quite touching, but they're almost touching. So the energy ends up um, arriving in this central space. And in a similar way, Matisse is doing the same thing here with these two hands. They aren't quite touching. However, he's placed them against the calf of the figure in the background so that even though the ring is broken, it's not broken because he's used the pink of the leg to, to, join, to join the fingers. Now, I think this break in the hands is probably an invitation for us to join the dance. Um, the figures aren't looking at us, they are not inviting us in, but this is perhaps a glimmer um, of, of an invitation um, so that we feel that we can step into this, into this circle and there's a space for us right there. Um, so there are two things really I want to have a, have a think about uh, when we're starting to look at this painting. And the first is, is colour. Um, and the second is, is these, these rather strange, probably, um, to many of you, figures. So if we start by looking at the colour, we've talked about the fact that there's a blue and green background and these pinkish, reddish figures. Those are the only colours in this painting. Now, this was painted in the early 20th century, um, not long ago, and Matisse has reduced the whole composition just to consist of three colours. Now, this was um, the making and the downfall of Henri Matisse, the downfall being at the beginning of his career. He came to be known as what, what is known as a fauve painter. I mentioned this earlier, and to many of you, that may have been a new term. Fauve literally means uh, wild beast. Um, and this was a term that was coined by an art critic called Louis Vaucel in 1906 um, at the Salon, at the Autumn Salon, um, after Matisse had exhibited some of his work um, in 1905, sorry, the year before, after Matisse had exhibited some of his work, having spent the summer in, um, on the coast in, in France with another artist called André Durand. And they exhibited this work at the Salon, which was a traditionally a very 
figurative classical um, art exhibition that was based on the academic principles of French painting from the previous century. Um, and Matisse arrived with a, a very, very colorful painting um, or collection of colorful paintings um, one of which was uh, a lady with a green face and a hat, which you may know, which is in the um, in San Francisco in the Museum of Modern Art there. Um, and he became known as a wild beast. He was criticized by this art critic um, and this movement, which lasted from 1905 to 1910, uh, which came to be known as Fauvism based on this word, um, Fauve. And, and Matisse and Durand were the proponents of this movement. And this was not something that Matisse strayed away from. And in fact, what happens, and it's been very interesting following the trajectory of his work today, because this is a very early work in Matisse, Matisse's career. And we'll go on to how, have a look at how it fits into his life shortly. Um, but he returns to this very, very simplistic um, composition towards the end of his life with works of art that are known as the cutouts, which many of you may know from a, a major exhibition that happened at the Tate Gallery um, not too long ago. Um, and this was where Matisse felt that his art had reached its perfect state and of purity. And that was color, line and form. And he didn't even have to draw that because what he did when he was making the cutouts is he's, he was creating shapes physically. So they were the purest, um, the purest uh, uh, color creations that he could that he could he could make. Um, and this is this is painted some 30 years earlier, but very, very much as with so many uh, fantastic artists, musicians, artists, uh, visual artists, you see a thread that runs all the way through their work, but the, the genius is, is creating different outputs, but the message remains the same. And we very, very much um, see that cutout language in this early, early work uh, by, by Matisse. Um, the idea of this painting and it, in its simplicity is that he does not want to distract the viewer with the fussiness of detail. So by reducing the figures and the background to its purest state, he is creating a new idea of space, but he is not distracting from the feeling of the painting. And of course, that's why this painting felt so appropriate to kick off this series because this painting purely expresses a feeling and the purer his art, the more expressive he feels um, that feeling comes across. Now this leads me on to the, the figures. Um, and for many of you, these figures will feel uh, somewhat primitive in the way that they've been painted. They are not, classical figures. They are not the figures of, as we've just spoken about, Michelangelo, who um, admires the, the, the classical proportions of the ancients and comes up with an, an, an anatomical um, idea of perfection. These are um, simply shapes that, don't get me wrong, the figure on the left uh, with this sweeping curve on the, on, 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 it, on, that follows its his or her left leg right up to, to his or her left armpit, um, gives you, in a sense, quite a, a classical shape. It reminds me of um, the discobolos, the discus thrower, which was a, a very famous ancient Greek sculpture that a lot of artists would, would, were looking at in the Renaissance, for example. So there are elements of classical, of classical um, sort of his classical training in this painting, um, but when we look at the others, there are twisted legs. Um, there's a, an ambiguity of gender. Are we looking at men? Are we looking at women? Um, that he, he has completely stripped these figures of, of gender and sexuality in a sense. They become um, simple, um, exaggerated human forms that are expressing movement and, um, uh, and feeling. And I think um, that's, that's, that's what Matisse succeeds in doing by reducing these figures 
um, to, to such, in such simplistic uh, terms. Now, one thing that I think is absolutely fundamental to, to know and think about when looking at work by Matisse, um, and that is that he was absolutely fascinated by non-Western art. He was an avid traveler and collector of um, non-Western objects, uh, notably North African um, and Islamic works of art. So, um, as many of you will will know, um, not so, some of the North African countries were were territories. Um, they were French colonies. Um, and so there was a relationship between France um, and some of these territories overseas. Um, and oh, I, I'm, I was really excited to kind of be thinking about this again, um, having, I worked on an exhibition that was called Matisse and his studio. And in the exhibition, we looked at how his works of art were um, influenced and affected by the objects that he had in his studio and his, living spaces were working spaces and his working spaces were living spaces. His whole life um, fed his art and vice versa. And no more clearly did that come, did, did it come through that these figures that he creates are, are the result of looking at primarily African, North African um, uh, and Central African uh, sculpture, which he collected through um, a dealer who was uh, based in Paris when he was living in, in Paris. Um, he collected uh, from around 1906. Um, so a few years before this, this uh, painting was painted, he had started to show an interest in African art. And he was really, really interested by the exaggeration of, uh, of forms and of anatomy um, and the reduction to kind of simple planes that, that, that the African artists would, um, would, would the, way that, the, the way that they would create their figures um, very much was it, was, it was a very creative um, approach rather than um, perhaps an, perhaps imitating the 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 anatomy of 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 um, of man and woman, and Matisse really admired this. Not only he collected not only masks, so you see these very reductive uh, faces in works by Matisse, but also um, in in the figures. And as well as uh, having an interest in in African sculpture. Um, he was, and this is probably what interests me most, is he was really interested in, um, in Chinese works of art as well. And some of the objects he had, he had this amazing ink stamp, which shows this very flat composition uh, with very little depth and is of course carved out. It's a, a sort of woodcut, it's an ink stamp. So it's carved out um, in very clear lines. And you really, really can see how that would have been something that would have inspired Matisse so much of his work, including this painting, is about positive and negative space and there being a, um, a, a present absence, if you like. Um, and I think so much of Chinese art, not only in uh, decorative arts, but also in calligraphy, so Chinese characters, is about the idea of negative and positive space and in fact for his 60th birthday his wife uh, gave him a, a calligraphy set but also a panel um, uh, uh, which had four Chinese characters uh, on it it was a, a wooden lacquered panel and he hung that above his bed um, when he was creating his cutouts and it actually became a part of his cutout compositions which he would stick on the wall um, and, uh, and, and surround it. Um, and he, 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 his first, his first uh, patrons, um, they were actually collectors of Chinese art. Um, and he said that he feels that they liked his paintings because they enjoyed the purity of the blocks of color. The year after he painted this, he befriended a man um, who was an Englishman who had previously been um, the assistant director of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And he was studying Chinese uh, art and um, that was his area of specialism. And this was something that they very much bonded over. So that was really very vivid in Matisse's repertoire uh, at this point when he's painting, when he's painting this painting. 
Um, so I think what we'll do is um, we'll just have a look at this painting in terms of its commission now. We'll think about where did it come from? Why did he create such a bold statement? Um, and who is it for? So this was a commission, this painting. It wasn't something that Matisse just came up with in his studio. Um, he was asked to paint it by a Russian collector, a man called Sergei uh, Shukin. Now, Shukin was one of two of the major impressionist, post-impressionist and modern uh, collectors in Russia uh, in the early 20th century, the other being um, someone called Morozov. And Sergei Shukin was, he was the son of, a, of an industrialist. Um, his, his father had set up a, um, a, a company that was um, a, a sort of wholesaling and wholesaler and manufacturer, um, and they were incredibly wealthy. And um, some of his siblings, some of Shukin's siblings collected works of art, um, and, uh, but mainly old masters and books. But Sergei really fell in love with uh, more contemporary styles of art. So the Impressionists that were painting in the late 19th century from the 1860s, the 1880s, really the post-Impressionists who were painting in the 1880s um, upwards. And then uh, Matisse and, um, and Picasso, his contemporary, who started um, really sort of taking centre stage in the first half of the 20th century and, and therefore inspiring um, abstract painters uh, from, from the mid 20th century, which, um, so, so this is the story of the history of art, if you like, and, and it's important to mention abstract painting here uh, when looking at this picture because it is a very decorative piece of piece of painting. Um, so he was collecting this, he had 40 works by Matisse, um, he had a Matisse salon um, in, his, in his palace in, in Moscow, and he asked Matisse to paint this and one other painting called Music um, for the spiral staircase in his palace, um, and he does, he paints both. Um, the other is in St. Petersburg, also in the Hermitage, and hangs alongside this painting, one of the very tempting comparative illustrations I'd like to show you because this painting is equally um, split into three primary shades, um, but is, uh, is the figures are all detached, they float in space, um, and it's a much calmer painting, it doesn't have the, 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 the vigour um, and the life and movement of this picture, um, and that's of course intentional. So they hung along uh, side by side in, in his palace um, until 1917, when they were confiscated by the communists. Um, and a year later, they were uh, gifted or, or, or um, bequeathed, as it were, um, or hung, let's say, in the, in the Hermitage Museum. Um, so they were, they were taken out of Shukin's hands um, and they've been there ever since. Now, this is probably a very recognizable image to a number of you um, because I maybe many of you have been to Russia, but I'm sure more of you have been to New York. And um, there is a, a preliminary study for this painting uh, called Dance One, um, which is in MoMA in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And it's not dissimilar. It's got much paler figures. Um, and it is very, very similar scale. It's uh, a one-to-one -one preparatory work and is really a finished work in its own right. Um, and that hangs in, in MoMA. Um, as I say, uh, the, the, he uses black in the preparatory study, which he takes out of, of this painting, but otherwise it's, it's uh, three um, colors. He uses a much paler pink for the skin of the figures. Again, another, um, preparatory, um, another another comparative image I would have liked to have shown you, but um, you will have Google right there, so so do have a have a look. Um, so it was commissioned by Shukin, um, and dance was a was a topic that Matisse really returns to in his throughout his whole career. He starts um, uh, his career, as I said, in 1905-1906, painting these very bold, um, uh, uh, sort of um, the, the Fauve, particularly the Fauve works in, in this time over these two years. 
and um and one of them is um is 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 a, a very famous painting that's now in in Philadelphia in the the Barnes Foundation and actually has this group, this ring of figures in the background, there's one more figure dancing, but he's taken that four years later um, and he's, he's, uh, he's, he's made that, that little small group um, into, into a much, much uh, larger composition focused purely on this, um, on this group of dancers. Also think of artists like Botticelli, uh, thinking right back to the 15th century, in the 1480s, Botticelli paints um, Primavera. Uh, and in this painting, you have the three graces who are all linking hands. There's also a painting by William Blake, um, which is Puck the Fairy and um, Oberon. And you see in, in that painting, there is a, a group of, of dancers also dancing. That's in the, in the late 18th century. So he's certainly looking back to create these, um, these, these reveling dances, but he picks up on this going forward as well. He paints, um, there's, there's another similar composition, including nasturtiums um, in the Pushkin and in, in, in uh, the Metropolitan Museum as well. Um, and then of course he revisits this idea, this very simple composition um, in, in his cutouts later in life. Um, so one other thing before we, we have a quick look at the life of Matisse um, is the idea of this swirling nature of the composition. He's really giving a sense of the energy of the painting through the idea of, and, and the circle of the group um, by creating very smooth contours in each of his figures. This is something that Cezanne, whom he calls the father of us all, um, it, it does, um, if you look at paintings of his, such as the bathers, you get these um, very, very uh, smooth lines, again, non-distracting lines, but the rounded forms of the breasts and the, the, the stomachs and the legs um, all add to this movement as we, we draw, as our eye is pulled from one side around um, to, to the other and, and, and um, follows this, this enchanting circle of, of dancers, um, which of, reminds us, of course, of, of, of uh, a ritual and this idea of his interest in indigenous peoples um, all feeds into to this quite um, almost cult-like, um, uh, excuse the, the promotion, <laughs> excuse the promotional reference, um, uh, dance, um, this Bacchanalian dance. So um, it, it, it's, it's, it's full of, of external references and context, uh, this painting. So who was Matisse? Um, I am sure many of you know a little bit, if not a lot about him. Um, he was born in the 1860s um, and he, he grew up in Paris. He was actually born in the north of France um, in Picardy and he, he, he moved to Paris when he was about 20. He enrolled in the Ecole des Beaux-Arts when he was 26. He was quite late to start painting. Um, interestingly, illness kind of bookend, bookended Mat Matisse's career. He, he got appendicitis when he was 20 um, and it was when he was bed bound uh, that his mother gave him a box of paints. And from that point, he says, I think I, I was in paradise um, and he knew that painting was his thing. Um, so it was only the result of that. He was actually training to become a lawyer his family, I think, were um, seed sellers, um, so uh, he would have um, continued the family tradition, but decided to um, to, to 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 move into painting. Um, he studied under Gustave Moreau in Paris um, at the Ecole des Beaux Arts, and under Moreau he learnt how to paint classically, as they would all have at the time. Um, he spent hours and hours in the Louvre painting after um, artists such as Delacroix and Chardin, artists of previous centuries and generations. Um, and in 1908, Matisse sets up a, a studio of his own um, and becomes a, becomes a teacher. Um, I, he was painting in conjunction with this, but he was collecting objects by then. As I say, he's been collecting African art for a couple of years already. Um, and he used these objects to teach in his, uh, in his classes. 
Um, it was in 1917 that Matisse moved down to Nice. Um, and down in Nice, he lived in an apartment that he really set up like a theatre. Um, it was in the 1920s that uh, Matisse spent, uh, spent the decade really inspired almost entirely by um, Islamic um, drapery and um, the idea of the odalisque, the, the, the harem, the, the, um, the odalisque. So he had female models that would pose for him in these very decorative environments. And this is why I want to say this, because decoration has always, always been central to Matisse's work. Um, and he is quoted, there are some wonderful quotes from Matisse that say that decoration and subject matter are interchangeable. The, 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 the subject and the decoration are one. And we get this here, these bodies become part of the decoration, they become, um, they become pools of colour, um, which 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 sit in harmony with um, the the the, co the colour fields that that make up the background. And he does the same in these in these Odalis paintings, where he uh, creates patterns that um, flow into the patterns in the skirts of the women that he's painting, and even into their hands and their faces so um he's he's thinking of theater now in 1919 he actually comes to london um and that's why stravinsky's music is all the more relevant because he comes to to london that piece was actually for um diaghilev's ballet russe that i played you earlier and he comes to work for diaghilev for the ballet russe in london um and he has quite an important trip here because he is here to design the stage set and costume um, for the, um, the, I think, the Song of the Nightingale. Um, and he, he visits the Victorian Albert Museum um, and the British Museum, and he's completely overwhelmed by um, the, the Near Eastern objects, Middle Eastern objects, um, su the su Southern Spanish objects, the Chinese objects in the British Museum. Um, and that's one thing that Matisse does throughout his whole life is he he travels. He's hugely peripatetic. He, uh, as I say, lived in France. He moves to Nice in 1917 and he stays really in the south of France with various trips to Paris. Um, but he travels to in in the uh, in the sort of 1910s, he travels to Algiers. He travels to uh, Morocco. He goes to Tahiti in 1930. He visits Spain. Um, he goes to the Alhambra, um, is completely bowled over by, um, by the architecture um, and decorative arts there. Um, he visits Italy as well, which I think is something that's important to think about because he, as I say, he does look at classical art as well as looking at these non-Western traditions um, of, of um, kind of simplified forms, if you like. Um, and but but what he really appreciates, um, he appreciates classical classical ancient sculpture. He had a, a female torso in his own collection, um, classical torso. But what he also appreciates is the the pre Renaissance art. So um, this again, this much more prim primitive style, um, if you like, of the of the fourteenth century, um, which of course we we can we can see very much in his in his mask like figures, um, and and the, the idea of these much more sort of simplified um, five forms before the high Renaissance. Um, blows that out of the water. Um, so he, he, he resides in, in Nice, um, he sets up this theatre in his apartment, he moves strangely from hotels to apartments in Nice, um, he has a supplier called, the, the family called the Ibrahims, who give him a lot of, supply him with a lot of his um, non-Western objects, so, so he builds his collection there, and he turns his um, his hotel room or his apartment into a stage set with all these wall hangings. Um, he has tropical birds and plants. Um, and in, in 1941, he's diagnosed with, um, with intestinal cancer. And he has a very um, uh, unfortunate, he has an operation which, which goes, goes wrong. 
um, and he's effectively immobile following that operation um, and bed bound. And that, of course, is why the cutouts suddenly become such an important part of his practice. Um, because he's able to do that. He's able to continue creating uh, from, from bed. Um, and he, of course, works on the Chapel of the Rosary in Vence. He moves up to Vence in 1943 um, with the th threat of war. Uh, and he stays up there and creates the Matisse Chapel, which I'm still yet to visit, but which he compares to a mosque um, and compares it to a, a very decorated um, but a very pure space um, and that leaves the dust um, at the door, which, which he, he, um, uh, he, he uses the analogy of a, of a mosque and taking your shoes off at the door before you enter when he talks about the chapel. Um, and he, he, he returns to, to Nice for the, for the last few years of his life um, and he, he dies um, in 1954. Um, he is quoted uh, a number of times. He's interviewed, um, obviously, um, many times. Um, he writes in 1908 uh, an essay called Notes, Notes of a Painter. Um, and it's very interesting, some of the quotes that, he, uh, that we have from Matisse, because they come to us at all different parts of his life. But as I said earlier, there is this real thread um, of... of uh, ambition and meaning that 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 carries through with him from the beginning uh, right until right until the end. And I'd just like to read a couple of quotes which I can't memorize um, to you now. So um, he talks about right, uh, painting female figures in uh, Notes of a Painter, 1908. He says, first of all, I imbue it with grace and charm, but I know that I must give it something more. I will condense the meaning of this body by seeking its essential lines. So hopefully that's relatable to, to this painting. Um, he wants his paintings to be representative of his state of mind. Um, and he appreciates the planes and proportions of African sculpture. He talks about, um, what I dream of is a balanced, pure and quiet art which can avoid the trouble or frustrating subjects. This kind of art gives everyone's mind peace and comfort, like a comfortable chair where they can have a rest when tired. Um, so this is what he's thinking when he's painting something of this scale for Sergei Shukin's palace. It makes no difference what are the proportions if there is feeling. And I thought that was particularly uh, uh, appropriate for this evening. I'm sure many of you first thought, well, these don't look like realistic figures because the proportions are all off. Um, but that sums up exactly what he's trying to, to do in this painting um, and, and create a feeling. Now, many of you probably are thinking this is a joyful painting. I personally think there's quite a lot of darkness to it too. So. We don't know what that feeling was that Matisse was trying to conjure in us all, but that's the point. The hands are open, they're welcoming us in and they're asking us to react and to feel. Um, and, and he's not defining what that should be. And of course, when he does the cutouts at the end, he explains to um, a man called Paul Rosenberg, one of the most successful art dealers in Paris at the time, that he's going to drop painting in favour of decorative works. Um, and I thought that was quite a nice place to finish um, because that was uh, 30 years later, uh, 35 years after painting this, um, and I feel that he already was creating decorative works um, right at the beginning of his, of his career. <laughs>